Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Centers. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can remain independent and stay connected with their friends and family. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First, a hearing loss from radiation to his brain tumor, and then later when he passed away. I'm the E of ENT. I only care for ears. I've taken care of tens of thousands of patients with hearing loss and performed over 10,000 ear surgeries. I'm also the founder of Listen Up Hearing Centers, and I've written a book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, I have a great guest. Uh, I've listened to her uh, give many presentations, and she's excellent. It's Dr. Meredith Holcomb. Uh, she is from the University of Miami Department of Otolaryngology, and she's a professor there and director of the cochlear implant program. She joined there a couple of years ago. Prior to that, she spent 13 years of her career at Medical University of South Carolina as a professor and clinician. She demonstrates a strong commitment to education, mentorship, and clinical research. She's published various book chapters and peer review journals, and she's presented locally, nationally, and internationally, and I've seen her presentations. They're excellent. She presents on cochlear implantation and clinical efficiency. I'm really excited to have her guest on the podcast. Dr. Holcomb, Meredith, thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. I'm excited to be here. So tell, tell us a little bit about your pathway. In other words, you know, now you're directing the University of Miami, and for some of the listeners, it's a pretty big and substantial cochlear implant program in the United okay. States. So tell me how you ended up in this segment of audiology, because there's a lot of different areas in audiology people can uh, take care or be involved in. Right. So um, I, I've been in this field for quite some time, since 2002, to be exact, actually, um, when I started my AUD program. And I recall the first clinical practicum I had with um, Marsha Odunka, who is Oliver Odunka's wife at the UN, UNC Chapel Hill, um, there was a lady there who was having her implant turned on for the first time. And it was magical. And the fact that she could hear her son standing behind her say, I love you, um, I, I, that was it. I signed me up, I was ready to do it. Um, interestingly enough, she now works for Cochlear and she's spreading all of her joy and giving the time back that was given to her for her Cochlear implant experience. But um, that she was it. And I always tell that story about her when she's around. So that's great. And so that that kind of lit your passion. And then you went and worked at uh, Medical University of South Carolina, cut your teeth, established yourself. And then what brought you to University of Miami in terms well, of what so you I was at, at your, USC for um, 13 years and, you know, very fortunate enough to have a great career there. But sometimes you need to grow a little bit more. And um, Dr. Talishi and Dr. Snap, who were here at University of Miami, were quite persuasive about coming down south a little farther and exploring some opportunities here. So um, it took about two years for me to really make that decision and for us to get everything worked out. But um, I moved here in June of 2019 and haven't looked back since. It's been um, uh, such a po positive change for my career in so many different ways and running this huge hearing implant program here with these amazing world-renowned neurotologists um, has just been a dream. That's great. And so tell me a little about it. So you come on. And so what are the challenges that yeah. you face? In other words, you know, I mean, sure, the program was running great, but like, so what are the things like when you say, okay, this is my baby now, I want to make some changes or some things I have to tackle. What are those issues that you're tackling? Well, one of the biggest issues we saw when I came in was the limited access to care for patients. So um, what I mean by that is it was taking about six months for a patient who wanted to get an appointment to be seen for a cochlear implant evaluation, which of course is a workup um, testing to determine candidacy. Those patients were waiting anywhere from like four, six months, maybe even longer. Um, the interesting thing is when you start looking at data and treating a hearing implant program like a business, which probably most people should think about that a little more, um, you realize that there are ways that you can uh, cut the fat in a sense in your own program to make um, to make it healthier and to open up some some doors for patients to be able to get access. So it was not. Um, probably the most well-received at first uh, message. Which is hard, in. right? 
You know, you've got, and I, I, I stand behind this team of audiologists here are by far the most skilled, I think, of anywhere in the nation. They have a um, wonderful way of caring for patients. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think we get stuck in our ways of how we care for patients. And um, our program was not producing any more cochlear implants, actually, than MUSC, where I had come from with um, about a fifth or maybe a fourth of the resources internally to serve those patients. So we knew we could make some changes. Um, it took about a year to get everybody on board, and now we're smooth sailing. So it's been tremendous change. So not that. It was, so what were some of those changes? I mean, that's really what people. I knew want you were going to ask me that. So, um, <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is if you if you look at all of our data from how much you know full time effort we had with audiology when I first got here compared to where we are right now, we actually have less full time effort, so less audiologists who are actually seeing cochlear implant patients. Um, but we have increased our surgeries by sixty percent. And we now only um, have about a one to two uh, wait time for getting patients in. So the way we did that is we didn't hire new people. We didn't invest money and resources for booths or staff. Um, we just efficiently kind of tried to run the program differently. And the, some of the things we did early on was combining appointments. So there wasn't, you know, 10, 12 appointments in the first year, which research says is really unnecessary. Um, and then the second thing we did was looking at extending some appointment times. And that seems kind of counterintuitive, but Get more done. I think when you're making a big change like this at an institution that's been running this long, you've got to give a little for them to embrace some of those asks. So that was my give is two hour appointments. You're going to probably think that's crazy, Mark. Um, no, no. I mean, look, <laughs> if you have to use it to transition to change, I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, managing it's, both it's not leaders. just declaring the change. You have to exactly. get to it. Right. I mean, that's, exactly. That's and, and sort of the mindset of, you know, two ears can be managed by the same audiologist. So really re reworking our mindset of hearing aids versus implants um, with Making some of those changes just to the scheduling and then reducing the number of appointments overall that are being seen um, in that first year after surgery, we opened up over 20 weeks, 20 full weeks of appointment times wow. and did not hire anyone. So that was cool. That's great. So tell, tell me, like, so from the initial evaluation to one year after implantation, what's that look like for a patient pathway for you? So now it's... Um, yeah, let's not talk about the past. We'll just talk yeah. about the past. Yeah, now okay. it's for appointment. So it's initial activation. Um, we would do that as quickly as a day or two after surgery. Yeah. Let's go. Somebody oh. presents as I ca can. Am I a cochlear implant candidate? Oh, got you. Got you. Okay. So if they are a cochlear implant candidate, and I'll tell you, we're a neurotology specialty referral clinic here. So our referrals for CI evals come from our neurotologists. The outside okay. of referring institutions refer to neurotology. Um, so we have a method of using our electronic medical record in this really cool way. Everyone is uh, sent to a pool. Um, two of us as audiologists triage all of those, um, those patients who are sent to the pool. We look at whether or not they are good candidates to evaluate, whether or not, um, you know, depending on their insurance, if they maybe shouldn't, get, aren't going to be able to get a cochlear implant. Um, we then give them a telehealth appointment. All right. Well, let's stop at that. So uh, yeah. I know I'm going to really, but so what does that look like? So that's off of the traditional audiogram you're doing that? Yeah. So just a traditional audiogram with unaided word recognition scores, SRTs, and um, then there, of course, a air and bone conduction. Uh, so the concept would be more likely a cochlear implant candidate. More, more likely. likely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So most of the time, we don't have anyone who we're weeding out, I guess, so to say, and sending in a different direction. But there are so, still some limitations with certain insurance companies that we can't get around. Well, but um, I'd also just for the listeners, there are people who perhaps on a screening audiogram, you might think that they're a cochlear implant candidate yeah. and they hearing aids might be the better option. That does right. happen. You or know, you so. might not think they're an implant right. candidate and, and they correct. actually are. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so I, I've actually tried, I've shied away unless people are clearly a cochlear implant candidate, I actually shy away very much from trying to predict because I, I don't believe that the I agree. Basic, basic audiogram is an instrument to determine. And, and shouldn't it, I mean, I think there are things that we should use to refer, but I think it's actually not. It, it, the analogy I give to people, it's like deciding, are you going to get coronary ar artery bypass graft off of an EKG? No, you're right. going to get a angiogram and the cochlear implant evaluations like the angiogram, like it's really looking at function. So anyway. 
go ahead. So no, no, I, I completely agree with you. And yeah. so I think that's the kind of the way we use our triage system is just to make sure that the patient's being funneled in the right direction right. for efficiency for our whole division of audiology. Right. So um, the next step is we reach out to them, our, our staff reaches out to them, they're offered a telehealth visit. We started this back when the pandemic was, you know, full-fledged, uh, you could only bring yourself into an appointment, right. couldn't bring your family members. Um, it has been uh, just, has changed the way we're doing this process. Transformative, completely. right? It's so worth it. Um, we have a PowerPoint that we came up okay. with, an um, old a slide deck, I guess, is what the young people say now. Um, and it goes through, if it's SSD, it goes through all of those options. If it's CI, it would go through all of those um, expectations, just little things about the surgery itself, the device, what we expect. Um, patients love it. It usually takes 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how many questions the patients come with. Their whole family can be in the room with them. Um, you know, we service people from, um, uh, very far away in Florida. Also, there are families who live abroad. Um, so we're trying to use it as, as you know, globally as we can within our licensure. And so um, just out of, out of curiosity, I assume the questions are done via typing, not uh, auditory, because, you know, answers are difficult for people who are hearing impaired. I assume that it's closed captioning. Yeah, so we have closed captioning on everything. And even before University of Miami had captioning on the Zoom that we use, we were able to use captioning on the PowerPoint itself. That's a cool feature that a lot of people don't know about. Okay. Um, so the captioning is great. Typically, we don't have any issues. We can also use translators for different languages live as well. We can use ASL interpreters live on Zoom. Um, from that, typically the patient is either, yes, I want to move forward and I want to come in to be tested. Or they may say, you know what, this isn't for me. I, I'm really not ready to to do this. And, you know, as you know, Mark, it's elective and we want patients to be committed to the process. Well, I also think it's a, um, uh, speaks well of society's resources, right? I mean, right. not that we don't want anybody who wants it to get it, but if people don't want it, we don't want them to get it because it becomes a squandered resource that somebody else could, could have. And as much as we'd like to think it's infinite, it's not, it's finite. And exactly. so getting people exactly. who want it is, is an important aspect of it. So great. Exactly. So then, um, you know, when they if they say, you know what, we're ready to go, I want to be seen for a cochlear implant evaluation. We schedule them at one of our six clinics that we have that span 100 miles um, in South Florida. Um, we have one clinic that's the farthest away from our Miami clinic. And one of my audiologists that I work with, he does all of the evals. He doesn't do any programming. So I call it like an internal sort of CPN uh, mm -hmm. a project that we have here at UM, but it's amazing how much time he has saved me um, from having to go up there and see those patients and sure. the time that it takes these patients to come all the way down to Miami. So it's really been uh, an amazing partnership with him. And he, you know, he gets to do something a little bit new for his practice, which he's really loved as well. Right. Yeah. So then they come in, we have the two hour appointment set up. Um, testing is in a sound booth with hearing aids that are appropriately fit. We verify everything before we do the testing. Um, we are more on the side of making decisions about candidacy. Uh, I mean, whole, whole patient-centered care, right? Sure. So we have some questionnaires too. But from just purely speech testing, we look much more closely at the CNC, the, the one-syllable words. Um, and then we really just use speech testing or sentences and sentences and noise, um, because that's what insurance companies want from us. But right. um, we look much more closely at words now. Sure. And sure. I think no. there's, the minimum speech test battery is being revised. Um, so that should be coming out sometime next year. And it will likely follow that as well with words being the primary um, indicator for whether or not a patient qualifies from a speech test performance. And so do you roll into counseling in that same session? We do. And, you know, the cool thing is because we did the telehealth, we've kind of gotten a lot of counseling um, done of early on. Um, and I forgot to mention this immediately after the telehealth, we send them an email with questionnaires for, you know, uh, quality of life, mental health screeners. We do that on everyone because there's such a link with mental health and hearing loss. Um, and then we also send them um, links to all three of the companies, to American Cochlear Implant Alliance. Um, to Facebook groups that are there. So typically these people, when they come in, they've done they're some pretty, research. Yeah, they're, they're very well informed on their own. Um, and then, you know, if they qualify, if we deem the S qualify, if we feel like a, a cochlear implant would benefit them more than their current hearing status, 
We show them all three companies. We do work with all three companies. Um, we are more on the side of really trying to figure out which company would work best for the patient. So it's their choice, of course, but we do try to guide them with our professional experience as well. So what what would be those things that would, and you don't have to go to the particular companies, but what no, would that's, be it's that a great question. Be, right? So, um, you know, I'll give an example now. It's not quite as quite as meaningful, but at one point, only one company had an app on the phone. And so right. thinking about using that as a scenario, um, at that point in my career, I was referring a lot of younger parents to that company because they would get notifications on their phone and yeah. everybody's on their phone all the time. And it would say if their son or daughter, if the device had come off. And so we felt like that was a better way for them to monitor um, the device use. Now things are somewhat a little more equitable. So it might just depend on you know, the age of the patient and their dexterity, whether or not they can truly maneuver the, um, the parts and the pieces. Um, some patients have a, a preference based off of the hearing aid they may have on the other sure. ear. We have a lot of bimodal patients. Um, and then, you know, I'll be honest, sometimes the clinic clinics, depending on how the companies are uh, cooperating with us at that time, you know, if it's easier or more difficult with customer service or parts and pieces, um, we may be very upfront with patients about that as well. Yeah, no, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, obviously, yeah. uh, my philosophy is always that they they ultimately pick. I want them to right. enter, enter into the marriage with whatever company that they uh, are going to spend the rest of their lives with. So, right. no, no, I, I think there's already. So one of the uh, questions I have, okay, so somebody comes in, um, you test them. Um, they don't, they're, so, you know, they're binaural, meaning they're two ears together appropriately fitted hearing aids, which is a huge conversation in of itself, uh, response is, let's say, you know, in the 90s, okay? And so how do you, so this is a fascinating part of the process for me, how do you get them into a different pathway to remediate the fact that they actually, with hearing aid technology that's appropriately cared for, uh, that's their true um, mode that they should be doing, right? Because there are a decent number of people who seek cochlear implantation because to yeah. lack of a better word, they have crappy hearing aids or the right. hearing aids aren't programmed correctly, right. right? And so they think, well, I'm trying hearing aids, but the answer is hearing aids are still the answer. But how do you, how do those get directed? So, you know, I think for those patients, um, pretty quickly when we appropriately fit a set of hearing aids that we have in our clinic, um, they generally notice right away that, hey, these hearing aids sound better than what I came in with. Um, and, you know, they can tell when they're doing the speech testing in the sound booth that they're not flunking, I guess. Um, and, you know, oftentimes they're relieved that they can continue I don't have to get along surgery. the hearing aid path. Right, right. Um, and I, I, I think the hard part is when we have patients, and we have many of these down here, when we have patients who financially are not able to afford another set of hearing aids. And so you're in kind of this um, tough situation of the, a surgery that their insurance may pay for isn't appropriate. Hearing aids are more appropriate, but financially that's not something that they can afford. Um, and in those cases, depending on the degree of hearing loss or the you know, how severe the hearing loss is, um, we might have a conversation about a less expensive option of amplification um, that's recently come, been approved um, for like yeah. over the counter hearing aids. That's not for everyone, but I do think that there is a place for that technology. Um, yeah, it'd be hard to believe though that if somebody was close to being meeting cochlear implant criteria, yeah. that OTCs would actually be able to aid their loss. I mean, that that would be right. your screening. All, so, just for the listeners, the fact that we're looking at their hearing test, your program is as a triage. They probably have uh, a need more volume than an OTC can give them. I would think so. Yes, I would think so. Um, I'm just saying that that could yeah, be. No, I, it's, I think we're both alluding you know, to that there's some problems in the hearing aid yeah. channel, for lack of a better word. Huge problems, and especially that, for yeah. our Medicare patients. Yes. Well, actually, I, I, I mean, my personal belief is that there's just terrible hearing aid care out there. And, and we, we kind of don't really talk about it as much as we should. Mm -hmm. But that's a that's a bigger topic than what you and I are trying to. I was right. just wondering, because that's one of the things we see is, is people who have invested in hearing aid care, they aren't a cochlear implant candidate. And then how do you remediate them? And so, you know, the hard part becomes like, I, I kind of, I use home maintenance as an, uh, an example, right? Like if you hire a, a painter who comes and paints your house really terribly, a room, you know, the next painter doesn't come say, well, I know you've already spent X on that paint job. 
um, I'll <laughs> discount it, right? They actually charge full both. They charge so, full, and, so and we, we would do yeah. that too. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. and so it's it's a tough spot because you know buyers, you know, and. and they didn't realize. So anyway, so now they've been declared a candidate. And then so um, you guys have the counseling. I assume you've done some screening with all of these surveys, et cetera, et cetera. And then what? And then if they're, you know, ready to move forward and they want to take this journey with us, um, we will then get them a surgery date, get authorization through their insurance company. And one of our fabulous surgeons will implant the device and then we start the aftercare. So when do they have the pre-op with the surgeon? Um, that's a, actually a great question. I think they have it the day before here. They come in a night before. I should know that, Mark, and I don't know that answer. Right. So, so I mean, and is that done? Because it seems like that could be also done via telehealth and also could be done via PowerPoint, right? Probably so. Um, I, I know that all our surgeons are still using telehealth in some part of their care. Right. I don't know exactly how, how often. Well, again, for the listeners, there is a point where the surgeon needs to actually look at the eardrum. And, oh yeah. They've already and, done that though. Right. Well, oh, because they came from your clinic, they right? So they the actually have already been yes. doing, right. Mm-hmm, and so that mm-hmm. got it. So, right. I'm just trying. Okay. So, so then they get surgery and then uh, you have initial stimulation. I assume that's, I don't know, we do ours a week after, but you yeah. know, there's a lot of variation. Same. So we, we could do it as soon as I've done them a day after, depending yeah. on the patient's flying far away. The yeah. problem is, is they're, they're still recovering from the anesthesia. Exactly. So it's, it's exactly. for the listeners, the problem is, is, is it's not that they're not hearing that day. It's just not as exciting because the, the patient is still recovering from the surgery. So it's right. just, we moved it out because it was just, it was kind of unfun. It's a little uncomfortable. <laughs> for yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so so we go anywhere between a, a week to three weeks. Um, sure. It really is availability for the audiologist. But like I said, right now, it's not a problem getting people in. Um, they come in. It's about a two hour appointment for that, too. They can bring their family members, uh, videotape, you know, right. do FaceTime with people. Do all the fun stuff. Yep. Do all the fun stuff. Um, and, you know, they leave typically hearing better than they came in with. Sure. But um it's oftentimes not exactly what they hoped for. But I, I tell every patient, the first day is the absolute worst you'll hear with the cochlear implant. Um, and it will only get better from there. How much better, we don't know. But we expect that it will improve. Well, we also hope that they knew that. Well, they should. Right? But you know, it's, self-education. It's, 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 it, right. It's interesting how I think, and, and even I can think about me as a patient. I had ACL surgery several years ago. And even though he told me, I would not be able to run or bike or anything, you know, a week or two after. I mean, it was a lot longer than that. In my head, I still thought that couldn't be possible, right? Because we don't really know what we don't know because we never Agreed. experienced it. So I, I think no matter how much we we counsel Help. and use the PowerPoint and it's all in writing now, it's still very easy for patients, I think, to get false hope. And also on a lot of the sites that are wonderful for support, they can also be very um very bad for the amount of information or the type of information that they're giving other patients. So why well, I, I mean, there are, a couple, there are a couple of things. One is I think there's what I call magical thinking. So yes. even if you told somebody like, Oh, you're not going to be able to use the phone in the week. Most people think, well, I am cause I'm different. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then the other thing is, is I think, you know, I do agree, you know, the Facebook sites and stuff are all that good, but keep, I always tell people, keep in mind that Everybody believes whichever implant they got, that's their religion, right? So, oh yeah, so, for sure, right, right. So, you know, by example, every religion believes that they're the, actually the right religion, and all the other right. religions are wrong, and that's kind of uh, how it goes with cochlear implants too. So, it, right. but it, it, it's still a, a wonderful process because in the end, you know, that's just the process to get to getting the implant and hearing better. Absolutely, absolutely, and you know, I, I would say more times than not for my patients. Uh, because we're implanting people with better hearing who have not had so many years of not hearing well, you know, we're seeing much better results than we did 15 years ago um, when when we were doing initial activations. And and some patients do leave understanding a lot of speech um, yeah. and maybe it doesn't sound great to them, but it, no. it blows my mind every time I do an initial activation for a, an adult, um, how much this technology has really improved over the past two decades. No, it is. It's amazing. I mean, I was talking to somebody uh, about pre two thousand that 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 there were body processors only, and they they were like, "Really? I can't believe it!" Right? Yeah, two thousand. They went up over the year, and they were pretty clunky when that happened. So it is amazing how far it's come. So. You know, and what's interesting, I feel like now, and, and patients are so dependent on all this technology, right? So now, if their app goes down or 
um, their streaming isn't available to their iPhone. It's like the end of the world. And to us who've been in the field for so long, we think, oh my God, like people couldn't do this even six years or seven years ago, you know, but it's beautiful that they have that much access to the world and their friends and their families now. And I think we as clinicians often don't appreciate how important streaming to a phone is because we don't depend on that ourselves. Right? I'd agree. I'd agree. Um, and I'm not trying to be tough, but it's interesting <laughs> how in the hearing aid world, mm -hmm. you readily talk to say to a patient, it'll be three to four weeks for your hearing aid to get repaired. And then that patient goes from having a hearing aid to having yeah. a cochlear implant. And all of a sudden we all say it needs to be fixed in two days. And so right. I, I, I look, I'm dedicated to hearing, but I actually think in some ways we're creating a little bit of a higher expectation that really stresses the system in terms of delivery. And so it's not yours or mine to deliver. It's obviously right. the companies to deliver, the but companies, it, exactly. it definitely creates that, that type exactly. of thing. I mean, I, the, as a person dedicated to hearing loss, there are hearing loss emergencies, but, you know, a broken cable is actually, you know, uh, it has to be contextualized. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> no, so. I, I completely agree with you. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, it's so generous that many of the clinics around around the U.S. have two processors on contract. So patients who get implanted, some clinics, they're able to, you know, give two processors. So you have a backup and one that you're wearing. Other clinics don't do that. And I know I'll see sometimes the patients on these chats and they're like, oh, my clinic did this and this. And I've worked at both kinds of settings. And I don't think patients understand the financial strain it is actually on the institution um, to provide the two processors. But, you know, we do it. I, I actually don't think the right. institutions understand the institutional strain. Yeah, that's honest. probably right. And so the question I have for you is, is whenever you bought your last car, did the auto manufacturer give you two? No, exactly. They, so, they did this, I, I actually think that everybody should go to a single processor. And I think that it's it's not fiscally viable. And it actually, yeah. unfortunately, prevents other people from getting implants. And so, I mean, there is, or it would speak to me that, well, then the processors aren't reliable. I mean, if Toyota, you bought a Corolla and Toyota gave you two and they say, well, what's the second one for? Well, when the first one doesn't work, you're going to use the second one. Most right. consumers would be like, that's crazy, right? And so- um, I, I think the I, hard thing though, Mark, is when you think about the little children and I've worked with children and adults my whole career and not to say children are more important than adults for their hearing access. Um, but I think about like every day that they miss school, um, because there's a broken device and they're having to wait maybe two days, or maybe it broke on Thursday and the company doesn't get it to them till Monday, Monday. you know, it adds up over time. And if you think about some of these families who have limited resources, it may be adding up more than uh, than other families, but you know that may well, be a bigger. I would reflect too. back to you: Why do they have a processor that's breaking that frequently? Right. So right. if it breaks once and it breaks on a Thursday and it's fixed by Monday, that's fine. If it's breaking other every other week, then there's probably either an issue with the processor or an issue with how the processor is being handled. Yeah. And so. I, I don't disagree with you that it's not important, but from a resource point of view, again, I mean, uh, you know, you could argue the same for driving that child to school, right? So the day that the car doesn't work, the child misses school. So let's have two cars. Yeah. Right. I so, suppose. I don't know. I don't know if I buy it completely, but I'll, I'll go with you on that. <laughs> well, I mean, I just think there's any other product where people actually have a backup because. No, there's not. And, yeah. and so, and uh, what I'm going to tell you is, is I believe the second processor is some of those same um, momentum and tradition that you encountered when you came in 2019. Um, there's probably just some hills you're willing to die more on than others, but right. I think that that's probably a vestige of some of those cultural issues too. Maybe so, maybe so. 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 <laughs> but I mean, the other, we all have a responsibility for our cochlear implant program to be fiscally viable. And I sure. will tell you- Oh, uh, absolutely, I completely If you look at that. the numbers from the operating room point of view, that second processor is a huge swing. $500,000 is what it saved us at MUSC to go from two to one right. in one year. Right. And so well, if you want to look at each particular case, right. it, adds it, up take a, even it more. takes a case from being fiscally viable to not being fiscally viable. Right. And for the listeners, the cost of the implant and the processor and all of that is by far the most substantive portion of the bill uh, by, by a factor of two to two and a half at least. 
So mm -hmm. anyway, so what is your, uh, you know, just your kind of one year follow up cadence? In other words, so initial stim, when, when, when do you see them over the, the, the summer? Yeah, so, so now our protocol is initial stim one month after initial stim, um, two months after the one month, which would be three months after initial stim, after and then the one year appointment. So okay. we're really following evidence based practice and um, which is, you know, telling us that either you could either do the three month or the six month appointment, but you don't need both of them. And so, uh, yeah, it's interesting because that's based on stability of map, correct? It's based on the stability of the map, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, the stability of the map is really what they come to see us for. So, um, a lot of Maybe. the other things that we could assist with, like accessories and pairing and um, rehab, um, it's not a sustainable model for audiologists to get into um, that part of the aftercare. So we really depend on the teams around us, which are the implant companies and um, the people that they've hired to do those specific tasks. We really sure. depend on them to help offload some of those non-billable tasks for us. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and I, you know, I'm aware of the data, <clears throat> excuse me, I would think the, the one thing that we're not um, plotting, which we need to, is um, uh, patient satisfaction over that time period, right? And so for most people that cadence will work, it's just the ones who aren't meeting what their expectations are. And so those are probably the ones that become more consumptive with more um, appointments. And ironically, they think it's the programming that's the issue yeah. when it's when it's not, right? And, right? and so actually, I would say probably between this, for you, the three month and the one year, you should have non-programming visits because it probably isn't the program at all. It's that they don't have ex the right expectations or they're not doing the right oral rehab or uh, something of that nature, which as you were talking about, you forgot that your surgeon told you you couldn't bike or run. So they forget a lot of that stuff too. They they do. And and the hard part is, again, thinking about this, this program as being, um, uh, you know, financially viable. Um, I, I, as an audiologist, actually don't have a good method of billing for those non-programming right. type appointments. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's probably not going to be responded well to from higher up in my institution if I'm doing a lot of free visits really. But um, we do have other people on our teams. We have social worker, we have an educational specialist, we have two auditory verbal therapists who certainly could bill for some of those services. So we try to resource, use those resources as much as possible. No, it's great. I mean, look, yeah. uh, obviously um, unbillable uh, or time that audiologists spend where they can't generate revenue. I mean, it sounds very business-like, but the reality is, is the institution uh, needs to be financially viable. Right. You can't, right. You can't. If you're not financially viable, then nobody gets cochlear implants. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, so exactly. That, that, Which that, we don't want that to happen. Correct. Correct. Well, well, this has been great. You sharing kind of, um, you know, the whole process, and obviously, uh, you know, I think you and I are aligned and touching on a couple of issues that obviously probably need some transformation or further discussion out there, but. Uh, no major differences, obviously. Uh, we just want to get more people taken care of and provide them with excellent care. So. Definitely. And the only other thing I was going to add, Mark, when you were talking earlier about the hearing aid, um, kind of, I guess, the concern that we all have in the community of how hearing aids are managed for patients, I was going to mention one of my biggest concerns right now is how many patients are buying hearing aid after hearing aid after hearing aid after hearing aid and are not being referred for a cochlear implant evaluation. And I think that is probably, to me, even more concerning than um, some of the patients who just need a little bit better hearing aid programming um, and they don't need the cochlear implant. So there's there's a lot of sides to all of this problem that we need to figure out. Yeah. So I guess, you know, my my perspective is is if you want to work your way back backwards. So if the medical outcome of poorly managed hearing or untreated hearing loss, as the evidence is showing, is dementia. Oh, for and, sure. And so if people's goal is to mitigate the risk of dementia as much as possible, right? if people are not maximally rehabilitated, regardless of modality, meaning regardless of hearing aid or cochlear implant modality, that's a problem. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so uh, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I think along that spectrum, there is a group of people who would benefit better with cochlear implantation. The hard part is, is some of them aren't even in hearing a technology that's even getting Absolutely. them their rehabilitative targets. And so it's it's a double-edged problem, right? Because it's interesting. I mean, people who come to me for hearing for cochlear implants 
what they're really saying is I don't hear as well as I want. And, you know, it's then our job to figure out what is it that they can do. Yeah. And I, I actually think there are a lot of people who don't have severe hearing losses who don't hear as well as they want because their hearing aid technology is not managed correctly. So, oh, definitely. Or they're yeah. just not in any technology, which you and I both know the utilization for any hearing technology in the U.S. is abysmal. It's, it's horrible. Right. But if you have a, my, my problem is, is of the 20% of the people who have pursued you hearing have aid technology, yes. a huge percentage of them are not, at least they've done oh. something about their hearing loss. And so my problem is, is they've done something, but they're still, it's still underdone. And so right. it, it's right. a, it's a pro I mean, these are big problems in terms of the delivery of hearing care. And so, um, but I, I don't think you and I, I think we're kind of talking <laughs> we about don't have time to solve that problem di today. Di different nuanced segments of the, of the problem. Exactly. So. Exactly. So, so this is great. Meredith, what, what's your favorite sound? Well, it's, uh, the sound has always been, um, one of my favorites, but I'm, I'm recently engaged. So it's even more my favorite now. So, um, it's obviously when a champagne bottle is popped. It's just such a great sound. You know, it's celebratory in some nature. Um, it's to me just a sound of like happiness and um, friends and gathering. And um, so I hope to have lots of those sounds in my near future while we celebrate my engagement and my pending nuptials. So. That's great. Actually, you just made me think I should go back off to all of my podcast guests and see if most of them uh, prefer high tone or low tone. Oh, that'd be interesting. Because I actually think, as I think about it, most people like low tone. It's it's hmm. usually that, a pop of a cork, sound of the ocean, uh, sound of a motor, wind, those types of things. Now, voices, obviously, when people say my children's laugh or giggle. So it's kind of interesting that they're uh, most of the non-human sounds are low pitched. Interesting. So, yeah, just as okay. I, because as you were telling me, I was like, nobody's ever said that, but it, you know, somebody told me the roar of a, a Porsche and uh, those types of things, or the rub, the wind going through leaves. They're all like low towns. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh, well, if you have presbycusis, uh, for the listeners, that's, you know, you're hearing in your low tones better than your high tones. So they can still appreciate the people with a hearing loss of aging can still hear the pop of the cork, hopefully. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so, so <laughs> Meredith, if, if people want to get a hold of you, how, how would they uh, do that? Yeah, so I have um, a Facebook page. I also have LinkedIn and then also my email. I'm always happy to answer emails just um, to the audience. Of course, uh, we can't give out medical advice on social media platforms, so be mindful of that. Um, but my email address is M-E-R-E-D-I-T-H dot H-O-L-C-O-M-B at med dot Miami dot E-D-U. So no E at the end of that name for everybody, just so you don't uh, misspell it. And so, yeah, this is Dr. Meredith Holcomb. She's a, a professor at the University of Miami Department of Otolaryngology and director of their uh, cochlear implant program. Thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. This has been really a great uh, for you to share your uh, experience and your perspective. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.